Good morning, everybody. So, I have bed hair. I haven't worked out. I haven't had a shower. Deal with it. <laughs> Deal with it. I'm also getting a wrinkle. My, my wife showed me right there. That's connecting from my eyes down. I'm getting old. And I gotta get some wrinkle cream to prevent that. So, some things are happening. Bad hair, wrinkles, the world, son. All right. So look, today in the book of Acts chapter 1, usually I go verse by verse. We got down to verse 6. I just want to go over something else. I'm going to briefly tell you what we see from 6 to 16, and then I'm going to jump straight into 16. Okay? You're here because you want to learn about the Bible, not because you want to hear me blabber about. So in verse 6, what we see is they're a little bit confused still. They're like, hey... Uh, you know, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel still? They're still asking this question. And he says, like, look, it's not for you to know. Uh, the Father has fixed by his own authority these things. But when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to come upon you. Then you're going to go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, preaching to all the tribes of the world this gospel of mine. Okay, that's what happens. And it says, when they were looking, he was lifted up into a, a cloud. Two angels appeared to their sides. And he's like, what, what are y'all looking at? Like, go get to work. Go wait on the Holy Spirit. He's going to come the same way he went. Like, you know, then it says they went to the upper room. They all started praying with one another. Came, they were of one mind, of one accord, devoting themselves to prayer. That includes the women that were with them, Mary. Um and then in verse, um, it says, and in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. This is verse 15. And he's going to start kind of preaching to them and talk them. And the first thing that he says in verse 16 is this. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became the guide to those who arrested Jesus. Okay. We're going to stay there for a minute. Um, and look, this is going to be about how God uses men to fulfill his purposes, a little bit about the nature of God, and we're just going to stick into Scripture and talk about that. And some of this might be uncomfortable. You might disagree with some of this. That's okay. Talk to me in the comments. If you're a loved one of mine and you talk to me all the time, holler at me. We'll talk. So long as the as the... As the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God comes through in this message, that's all I want to do. Um, and, and maybe even reveal some of his just nature that we see in Scripture. How he handles things historically and even today. Um, and one of these big ones was Judas. Um, I've had a lot of conversations about Judas. And so... It says, it says, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand through David. So David doesn't get, David doesn't get the, uh, the credit for speaking about Judas beforehand a thousand years before it actually happened. The Holy Spirit knew that this was going to happen, knew this was the purposes of the Father, and knew that Judas would be a part of the plan that was predestined from the beginning. And we're going to we're going to talk about that. I know some people are uncomfortable with that word. It's all throughout Scripture. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, and so, he became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Uh, he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Okay? That's Judas. He was a number among us was allotted his share in this ministry. Then they bought a field with the money. He went He he went and gave the money back. They bought a field with it, uh, and it turned into what was the field of blood, is what they called it, because they, you know, Judas went and actually committed suicide, hung himself, uh, and he must have hit a rock or, or something because his bowels came out. Um, so the, the rope's integrity wasn't good, or, or something happened where he fell on the rocks. Uh, or was just busted open in some way by force. Um, I don't know. I don't want to read too much into it. But that's what happened to Judas. And so, I'm going to read just something, you know, that that I, that I read. Um, 
God's providential control over events takes into consideration the acts of human will, even those that are opposed to him. Let me read that to you again. His providential control, that's God's, providential control over events takes into consideration all the acts of human will, even those opposed to him like Judas. So what God isn't is he isn't a puppet master. So he doesn't just make you do stuff. He uses the evil in men's hearts to accomplish his purposes. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into that. But an example, there's example, example of how God uses the will of man to bring about his own purposes. I mean, and we see him, you know, bring use means to bring about his purposes all the time. We see Moses using a stick to strike the water, an east wind, supernatural power. Um, But in redemption, he's called, we're going to start out with some good stuff and go into Judas, but he's called certain men to significant participation um, in his purposes, whether for good or for bad. Let's You know, John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. That's God's sovereignty on display there. God does, God chooses you and and appoints, right? In in John 15, 16, that's what he was doing. When we're talking about the apostles, okay? So we're talking about all 12 of those right now. So I'm trying to get across the point that like, this wasn't a mistake. He did not choose Judas and And Judas just kind of showed up. Judas was an instrument, a a means by which God was going to accomplish his purposes and use the evil that dwelt in Judas' heart already to accomplish the purposes of bringing about what would redeem all of those who believe. And so in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says this, Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, prophets, teachers, um, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating various gifts of tongues. uh, And so what, what we see is God is distributing the gifts. He's appointing the people to places of of, of, of leadership within the church. This is all God behind the scenes working divinely to bring about his purposes appointing man. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. Okay, 11 through 12, we see, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith. Again, it's God who is it's God who is, is giving the apostles, the prophets, he's giving them their gifts that they are then using because they love God to bring about his message. He's empowering those that are his, okay? And in the same way, if a man is evil, God can restrain him in the spiritual sense by putting a shackle on him and pulling back the chains. But what happens when God lets go of the chain? What happens when he allows you to fulfill all the evil of your heart? In this case, what Judas did. Okay? And to say God doesn't have that level of control is blasphemous as far as I can tell. Um, looking at scripture, I mean, he absolutely, his hand of lawfulness is in front of evil and it even says in the last days he's going to bring up his hand and lawlessness is going to, to, to just come take over this earth, right? And so we know that evil is, is, is in the hearts of man, but it's absolutely with, restrained by the power of God. But there's moments where he just lifts his hand and he allows those people to carry out the will of evil that's in their heart, okay? And so we come down to the peculiar case of Judas. He was chose by Jesus, okay? But he was evil. 
He was. He was evil. Um, so how can this be so? How can Jesus choose an evil man to be among them? Um, someone with an evil disposition. You know, how can this be? So this is, this is what we know about Judas. In John chapter 12, verse 6, John reveals something about Judas that I had passed over many times. This, I'm going to give you an example of, of something that was said about Judas. This was when Mary was about to anoint Jesus with the perfume. And as you remember, Judas was head over the finances. He controlled the money. And so he, she broke this perfume, put it, you know, some, one, one gospel says over his head. The other one says his feet and his head. Um, and Judas speaks up. And he says, like, holy smokes, you know, why was this anoint, anointment, ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This is what John says about his intent in verse 6. John, as a writer, is revealing this. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And then Jesus said, leave her alone. He was a thief, okay? When you are the sin that you commit, it's not like he struggled with this sometimes. It was, no, he, but because he was a thief, he was a thief. He was his sin. You, what can't you do to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Can't be a drunkard like you can struggle against your sin, being in the Holy Spirit, and make the mistake, but there better be repentance. There will be repentance because you have the Holy Spirit in you. You will persevere to the end. You will come back to God. Like, that's, that's his promise to you, right? That he's going to be in you, that he's going to write, you know, he's going to write his law on your heart. He's going to give you a new heart. A one that's more sensitive to things that offend him. But here you see, he's just a thief. And that's just what he is. It doesn't say anything like that about any. It says, you know, uh, get behind me, Satan, on Peter. We see Peter commit a sin, but we see Peter repent. We're going to get into that for a minute. But he chose Judas, and it's clear that he chose a thief. I'm going I'm to go to a very controversial verse here. Um... I've actually covered this and some other stuff. And I want to bring about what I think was happening with Judas. In Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6 um, is some really strong words. And it's, it says that it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who've shared in the Holy Spirit, not filled, but shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. So you've tasted the Word of God. You've shared in the Holy Spirit. And it says you've once even were enlightened. You tasted heavenly gifts. And it says, but, and it says you've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age have come, but then have fallen away those that have fallen away through all of that, it's going to be impossible to restore them to repentance since they're crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm. And so this is a really controversial verses because it, 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 you know, if you interpret it one way, it means that man who's saved and sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit can lose his salvation. Um, another interpretation and, and one that I think at the very least without getting into what to what I believe on that, let's talk. Let's attribute that verse to Judas here. What did Judas do? Do you think he sh shared in the or participated in the like covenant community of believers? Yes, he did. He was among the twelve. He he looked into the eyes of Jesus. Do you not think that he felt comfort? Do you not think that he felt the peace of the other eleven? That like the goodness, the seeking righteousness, the the being confused, but 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 over those three years learning to love one another through through these teachings of Jesus and coming to a further understanding and like you know they laughed, you know they loved intensely, you know they grew as a group. 
And and you, they even saw public repentance. They saw, you know, Judas would have seen public healings. Um, and he had to have been excited about what was going on around them. Because it had to have been beautiful at times. And I think in a lot of ways that's tasting of a heavenly gift. Certainly he shared in the Holy Spirit. Like like in, in the gathering of saints together, he shared in that and tasted the goodness of the word of God for sure. He did those things. But, He fell away, right? Like he fell away. He didn't persevere to the end. He was like a, a seed that fell on rocky ground. He was there amongst the other seeds. He was there. He fell on the rocky ground. But what happened? Like he didn't grow roots like the other ones did. And he was burnt up in the sun. The weeds of the world choked him out. Like he didn't take root like the other 11 did. And so no good fruit was bore, but that didn't mean that he didn't do good things. That's like saying atheists can't do good works. That's crazy. Of course they can. And Judas did good works. They were sent out two by two. Do you not think that he did great works? I'm, I'm reading into the scripture and I might not should do that. But if you sent out two by two and he says that you have gifts of healing and you have gifts to uh, that's in uh, Luke 9, 1 through 2. You know, do you not think that he healed? Maybe he didn't, but he certainly was sent out two by two to do that very thing to teach, to heal. He was given power by Jesus. And this is this is a verse I want to take you to. So I think, you know, and I wanna I wanna I wanna share with you one story too. Conor McGregor is an MMA fighter, um, not great character. It's just easy to see. You can look at James, you look at his life, you just don't see a lot of good fruits um there. Although he does claim to believe in Jesus, there's just no good fruit there that I can see. That doesn't mean that I'm not gonna speak to his salvation, but I don't see the fruit. And uh he just came out with a documentary and he had to do some public service. Some, some public service, and uh, he went to a church to do it. And he was interviewed in that first one, and he was like, dude, I just got a buzz from that. Like, I want to go back. And he ended up continuing to go back to this church, and he was feeding off the goodness, the community, the love, the differentness of what was going on. It's not like the world in the body of Christ for those who truly belong and are filled and sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit and have the promise of salvation dug deep into them and giving them a new heart. Like, like being around those people, man, there's men in my life that when I get around, I just, it's just good. When I'm around my, uh, when my mom, it's just good. You know, like when I'm around, uh, some of my friends, it's just like really good. Matt Renahan, like you just feel, you feel the Holy Spirit and it's a good feeling. And Conor McGregor felt this. And he talked about it. And he was like, this is a buzz. This is a, I, I shared and tasted a heavenly gift. I might have shared and, and tasted the goodness of the word of God. But like, you didn't commit. Like, but you never were changed. You might have had guilt about what you did, but your guilt didn't lead to repentance. And so... In 1 John 2.19, it says this, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you, you, one who are persevering to the end, have been anointed by the Holy One and you have all knowledge. Let me read that one more time. And think about Judas. Think about Conor McGregor even, and I don't, I can't speak to him specifically. I'm actually a huge fan, if you know me. But but think about the lives of people that, that that claim it, that say it, but they don't live it. There's no repentance. Listen, who don't persevere to the end. Think about Judas's life. First John two nineteen. They went out from us, but they were not of us ever. For if they had been of us, if they had been one of us. 
they would have continued with us to the end. The perseverance of the saints. But they went out that it might become plain. Because they went out and they didn't come back, it might become plain that they all are not of us. That's Judas. That's Judas. He was unchanged. In 12.6, it says that he was a thief. And so, the question is like, one, think about that it's possible to have people among you that's like Judas, but we have to trust God that He's going to use them to bring about a purpose. Like, he's not going to let an evil person just be evil. He's going to use them for his purposes to bring him glory. More on that in Romans chapter 9. We're definitely not going to get into that. But I want to read you one other thing about just like Jesus choosing an evil one to be among them. And we're going to go through this a lot, but this is in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, it says this in, in verse 27. It says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. They were gathered together in, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Pardon? Let me read that again. We're talking about a sovereign Lord. If you go back to verse 24, it says, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who had made the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said to the Holy Spirit, Why do you Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and plan had predestined to take place. Does this mean that God is a puppet master? It doesn't. It doesn't. Did these men have free will to choose Pontius Pilate and Herod to make decisions that would ultimately lead to Jesus' sacrifice on a cross? Yes. Did Judas have the same choice? Yes. Were they following the evil of their hearts? Yes. But did God plan it and predestine it with their will in mind? Yes. Go back to the first thing I said. His providential control over events takes into consideration the acts of human wills, even those opposed to him like Judas or Herod or Pontius Pilate. And so we see this over and over in, in Isaiah chapter 10. If you want to go there, in Isaiah chapter 10, we see the Assyrians being used to judge Israel. It says this, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice. Okay? It says down in verse 5, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger. So, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation, I send him. And against the people of my wrath, I command him to take spoil and to seize plunder and to tread them down like a mire of the streets. But he does not so intend. And his heart does not so think. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. Listen to that. Listen. Listen to me. Listen. Listen to Scripture. Ah, Syria. The rod of my anger, God, right? 
The staff in the hands is my fury, God's. Against a godless nation, I send him. He's sending. It's his fury. It's, it's his rod to take the spoil, to seize the plunder. And it says he doesn't even intend to do what I'm going to do through them. This is Assyria. Because what he intends to do is to destroy Israel or to, to judge them for the purpose of bringing about repentance in the nation of Israel. He's going to come hard down on Israel so that his people will repent. But he's saying in, in, that it's in his heart, even though his heart doesn't intend to do the thing that's going to happen, but it's in his heart to destroy. So here you see even a group of people, a nation, a king, it's in his heart to destroy, and God uses that evil to bring about the purpose of of, of smiting Israel so that they will repent. And in the same way, you see Judas, you see Herod, you see Pilate having evil in their heart. Maybe their heart doesn't intend to bring about the goal of salvation to all who would believe in Jesus. It certainly wasn't their intent. Their intent might not even have been to send Jesus to the cross. But he used the evil in their heart to bring about his purposes. But that didn't impact their will. Do you see? Their will was already to steal, kill, and destroy because their father is Satan. God doesn't make man be evil. It's their choice. But he certainly doesn't miss an opportunity to bring about his goals, to bring about, to bring about his glory by using the evil in the hearts of man that includes Judas, that included the Assyrians. And it says their heart didn't even intend to do it. And then he, by the way, he uses them. He uses them. He, he gives them more slack on the leash of evil and allows them to carry out what was already in their hearts. And then he judges them for it. Then he judges Assyria. Woe to Assyria. And he judges them. He judges them for doing the very thing that he wanted them to do. But God didn't will them to do it. They just did it because it was in their heart. Do you understand? Do you see how God can predestine things to occur without being a bully? Does it make sense now? Like how I'm very comfortable with the word predestine? Because he knows the hearts of man and he can predestine things to be. But he doesn't make man evil. What he does is he redeems man sovereignly and by grace, freely, distributing it. He does that. He makes man alive from his evil. But whether it's God's foreknowledge of events that they would never come or whatever it is, he uses the evil of man to bring about his purposes. I, don't, I think I've, I've drove that home enough. And so you see evidence of this. And this is the last thing before I'll close because I want to close at 30 minutes. You see evidence of this about how they work. Peter denied Jesus three times. What did he do? He repented. He felt guilty, and that guilt led to repentance. Judas felt guilty also. He felt guilty also. So much so that he went and returned the money to the very people that had given him the money. But he didn't repent. He went out from us because he never was of us. He never was changed. He never was... You use the terms loosely because there was no Holy Spirit then. You say Christian. He was, he was a disciple, but he wasn't. He was a thief. And we see that today. And you have to be aware of this around you. That's why it says, look at the fruits of a man. John knew that Judas was a thief. Right? And so you have to have the powers to discern what's going on around you, but you also have to respect the nature of God and don't be scared of the word predestined. Don't be scared of it. Okay? I was scared of it for a long time and I passed it over and I didn't understand it until one day I was like, all right, I keep seeing predestined. I keep seeing all these other words that I'm uncomfortable with. Um, elect. Uh, like, what, what does all this mean? Sovereignty of God. The truth be told, 
said, God is just and is always just and will remain just, but he has a perfect plan for everything and everyone. And we see here that guilt, just because you feel guilty about the things that you're doing, doesn't make you a Christian or a good person or someone that's redeemed by the power of the Holy Spirit and sealed by the promise of eternal life. It's not what it means. You have to repent. You have to turn from your ways, your evil ways. If you're there, if you find yourself being Judas, if you find yourself going to church and enjoying and tasting the gifts and sharing in the Holy Spirit, not being filled, but sharing in it, sharing, tasting the goodness of God, but you know that your guilt isn't leading to repentance and you're just living like the devil outside of this conversation we're having today. You are not redeemed, sir or ma'am. You are not sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit unless you repent and come back. And that would be evidence of the fact that it is true. Repent, persevere. That's what God calls you to do. That's what Jesus calls you to do. Turn from your sins I could be talking to you and you could already have given your life and, and being joined with Jesus in baptism before. You could have, that could have already happened. Or maybe it hasn't happened. And I think that's an important first step of faith. And the faith that you have in your heart when that happens joins you with, with Jesus in some way, um, some powerful way. Um, we're going to talk more about that. But hopefully you understand a little bit more about Judas the nature of God, how he uses the evil in the hearts of man, why I don't think God is unjust or a bully. And we're going to get more into that when we get to Acts chapter 5. But for now, I'm going to leave it there. Y'all have a great day. I hope you took something from this. Love y'all.